Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. Welcome, my darlings, to this wonderful Valentine's Day collaboration with my fellow Corvids. As such, I bring you a Valentine's Day murder. I do hope you enjoy. The Evil Tree in the Woods by Freddy Gran I look outside my bedroom window and see the creepy woods that is close to my childhood home outside of the city. I am eating my breakfast in bed, chocolate milk and cereal, white bread sandwich with a thin slice of ham on it. I'm watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I love them. My childhood room is full of their stuff. Action figures, bedsheets, etc. I also like to ride my bike and build Legos, read comic books, and play video games. I have a Super Nintendo with Super Mario World, Turtles, In Time, and even Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past. I'm waiting for Timmy to come over. We are best friends. We both love turtles and video games, chocolate bars and pizza. One thing is strange about Timmy. He likes the turtle with the blue bandana, Leonardo the best. <laughs> I know, right? Cray cray, everybody knows that Raphael is the coolest with his red bandana and dual sigh weapons. Someone's knocking on the door. It must be Timmy. We're going to have so much fun. We are going to go into the creepy woods, even though my parents won't let us, even though it is a bit scary. We're going there anyway. Just please don't tell my dad, okay? My mother opens the door and lets Timmy inside. I come running down the stairs. Okay, have fun, my little angel. Just don't go into the woods. You know they are scary. We will stay out of those creepy woods, I assure my mother. But of course I am lying. No, we are just going to play with the dog Buster and throw some water balloons. I can always count on Timmy to help me back up my lies. He's my best friend for a reason, after all. We go outside and I pet my dog Buster. I gave him some treats. He's coming with us. The woods are way too scary to go without him around. We see a wasp's nest on a tree. Remember when we threw a water balloon at that nest and the wasps attacked? <laughs> I laugh and tell Timmy. Yes, of course, and David got stung, Timmy laughs. Poor David. He was allergic to wasp stings and is no longer allowed by his parents to come over. We made sure my mother is not watching from the window and marches on the small walking passage into the woods. Maybe we'll find a treasure in here. Timmy is excited. Yes, maybe we will. I nod my head in agreement. I'm carrying a large backpack with the water balloons and two soft air guns in it, some snacks, and in my shorts pocket I have a lighter and a Swiss Army knife. It is a sunny summer day. No school, nice weather, hot and not raining for once, which is unusual for a Swedish summer. But when we walk longer into the woods, it is a feeling, a feeling of something wrong, something evil. We both start to feel cold. M maybe we should go back, Timmy asked me, and I agree that maybe we should. But we both keep going into the woods anyway. It's like some compulsive behavior, like scratching a wound that is healing. You know you are not supposed to do it, and it's a bad idea. But somehow you just cannot stop. And that's when we hear it. That voice, a voice I will never forget. It sounded like a young woman, beautiful like an angel. Help, help me. 
We did not hesitate. We were both Boy Scouts, always ready. But when we got in there, we found no damsel in distress. No opportunity for any of us to be Captain Save. <laughs> I guess we were no King Arthur and Sir Lancelot. Just two little boys in way over their not fully developed heads. There was a tree, shaped to look like it had the face of an evil old man, with a pointy branch for a nose, two holes for eyes, hair and a beard made of leaves, roots for feet, and branches for arms. Ha 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 Did you expect someone prettier? It spoke with its real voice, the voice of an old and mean old man. Oh, help me! It switched back to the girl voice, just to mock us. Timmy, Buster, let's get out of here. I was starting to get really frightened. We turned around only to see that the mean old tree had spread its roots out in a circle around us, and we had nowhere to go. Timmy grabbed a soft air gun. I told my best friend, and we both got our guns out and started firing. Unfortunately for us, we were both lousy shots, and their air gun pellets did not do much, if any damage to the tree with the face. One of its branches stabbed Timmy right through his chest. He started bleeding intensely and dropped his soft air gun. I rushed over and broke the tree branch of people in deep distress and sometimes pull off feats of Herculean strength. I've even heard of mothers lifting cars to save their babies. The tree took this opportunity to stab me through my backpack and into my back. I really think that backpack saved my life. And so did Buster. He jumped up and bit the tree branch, causing the tree to let me go. I was wounded, but not out. I launched an attack on the tree, burning its nose with the lighter. Oh, it hurts! It burns! Curse you kids! I hate humans! I just wanted to eat you alive, you tasty little suckers! Seed you, mother suckers! I will get you for this! Enough of your threats, you old tree man, or whatever you are. Just shut up and die. I stabbed the tree right into its left eye, and then into its right eye. I burned that sucker, hair and beard both. I kicked him in the nuts, and Buster bit his foot branches. I almost felt bad for the mean old tree. Almost. But then I remembered myself, that mean old bastard had tried to kill us both, and he got what was coming to him. It looked like he was okay, so I went to get Timmy, and I had to help him walk out of the woods, holding him the entire way. We finally got to my home, and I could feel safe again. I told my parents what had happened. My dad got the axe to go and cut that evil tree down once and for all. I looked on through my bedroom window. I could see my dad walking into the forest. I could see a tree start moving. And then all of the trees started moving, quickly killing my dad and ripping him to pieces. And then they all started to wander towards my house. So quote, this raven. I downloaded an app called Fit Running Buddy by Blair Daniels. I got a new fitness app. I'm in terrible shape. I run like 12 minute miles. Thankfully, this new app, Fit Running Buddy, claims to turn even the laziest couch potatoes into fast runners. They even had a guarantee. If you don't run an eight minute mile in your first month, get your money back. When I downloaded it, it asked for all the usual info, name, height, weight, access to my location so that it could log my distance, calculate my speed. Then it popped up with its first notification. Please schedule your first run. I typed 8 p.m. Wednesday. I do an evening run after work to burn off some of my dinner calories. Thank you. We've scheduled your run. When Wednesday came, the app gave me my notifications throughout the day. At 4 p.m. Remember, Bethany, your run is tonight at 8 p.m. 
I dismissed the notification. But I got another one at 5 p.m. And at 6 p.m. In fact, I got one every hour until 7.30 p.m. When they came in every five minutes. Are you ready for your run? Get pumped. Your run starts in 15 minutes. At that point, I was pretty annoyed. But then I laughed as I realized that's probably why the app is so damn effective. Even the worst of us will get so irritated by the constant notifications, we'll go running just to shut the damn thing up. At 7.55 p.m., I pulled my old sneakers out of the closet. Then I put on my favorite playlist, put in my earbuds, and stepped out onto the sidewalk. I ran down my street, took a left, and entered the park. It's usually desolate in the evening, but tonight, there was a man sitting on the bench. He looked up at me and smiled. I forced a smile back despite feeling awfully self-conscious about how slow I was going, how heavy I was breathing. The first few minutes of the run went well. I'd made it halfway around the pond and I didn't quite feel like dying yet. That was good. Really good. Then I got that prickly feeling on the back of my neck. You know the feeling. It's like every muscle, every cell in your body is screaming, Someone is watching you. Turn around, you idiot. Yeah, well, I was an idiot this time, and ignored it. Because every cell in my body was also screaming, Stop and sit down. Walk home. Eat some ice cream. You earned it. Then, seconds later, I heard a distinct thump behind me. I yanked out my earbuds and whipped around. My heart stopped. A man stood behind me, the same man that had smiled at me on the bench. Now, he watched me with a different smile. A predatory, wolfish smile. Eyes taking in every inch of my body. Heart pounding, I picked up my pace. So did he. He broke into a run, and he was fast. In seconds, he'd closed half the gap between us. I broke into a sprint, my tired legs pumping as fast as they could. No, please, no, no. I whipped around. The man was only several feet from me now, and something silver glinted in his right hand. Get away from me, I screamed, pushing myself faster. My legs ached, my lungs burned, my vision blurred with tears. I felt like I was dying. I glanced back. He was right behind me. I could feel his hot breath on my neck, feel the air shift from his movements behind me. I saw the exit to the park up ahead. Skin prickling, fire spreading through my muscles, I forced myself forward. Something cold and sharp pressed against my back. I screamed. Then, as soon as I felt it, it disappeared. I ran like the wind, stumbling over my feet until I flew through the park's exit. Then I glanced back. The man had stopped. He just stood there on the sidewalk, no longer chasing, just watching. At that exact moment, my phone pinged with a notification from Fit Running Buddy. Congratulations, your time for running your mile is 7 minutes 47 seconds. We hope you enjoyed the experience. Please schedule your next run now. I adored my little songbird, my cheerful, little, insignificant, feather-covered friend that made it a point to perch just outside my window every single morning as the sun lifted its way over the horizon. I appreciated your shrill song more than anything, your metallic chirps and slightly off-tune whistles that managed to find the path into my heart and pry open the iced-over doorways into my soul. Somehow, you managed to make me feel something that I once thought I would never feel again. Happiness. The first morning I saw you, I was hesitant to actually see you for what you were, my medicated mind made me want to see nothing more than a crimson blur on the concrete that was the ledge outside my room. I call it my room, but it was more like a cell, a prison that was built to house me until I died. A pathetic collection of four walls that was identical to every other in this building. Rooms meant to house people like me. People that were determined to be a threat to themselves or others. I was told that something in me was broken. I was told that I was likely to break and hurt someone. I was told that I was a burden to society. But that morning, 
when my eyes focused on the pale orange and pink color of the sunrise as they contrasted the colorless concrete. You were the little silhouette that I, at first, failed to comprehend. My eyes struggled to actually focus on you, but as they did, I saw that beauty with which my life would be graced. You stood there, your crest held high, as to signal how confident you were in your own existence. Your crimson feathers, the black circles around your eyes, almost like a bandit's mask, all of it managed to steal my focus from the morning sky. That morning was the first time that a smile had managed to creep its way across my face for as far back as I could remember. You were a shining beacon in the shadows that had encompassed my life, my mind. The darkness that had become the foundation of my world felt like it had been suddenly fractured. A seam shown to me and a loose thread highlighted. With your small orange beak, you gripped that thread and you pulled it as hard as your tiny frame would allow. I stared at you for as long as you sat there. I watched you stretch your wings. I watched you preen some of your feathers, take in the warmth of the sunlight, and I watched as you flew down to the ground, grabbed some sort of berry from the bush by the wall, and made your way back up to enjoy the bounty of your hunt. You tore into that berry, satisfaction taking you over. It was then that my course of action became clear. I had to keep you coming back. I had to figure out what I could do to keep you happy. If I had to be honest, I only knew one thing about you and your kind. You liked seeds and berries. I started talking to the orderlies that I had become friends with, and I practically begged her to add blueberries to the lunch menu. It was a strange request on my part, but not something that would really concern her. In the end, she relented, and when lunch came around, I was able to get my hands on a few just for you specifically. When I got back to my room, I opened my window slightly and I pushed the corner of the screen, separating it from the exterior frame. While the bars over the window were able to keep me in, I could at least create this little doorway between our worlds. I placed the berries on the windowsill, and I sat there waiting. I sat on my bed watching the windowsill for the entire night, knowing that you would be there to find them first thing in the morning, and I refused to miss it. Sure enough, as the sun started to peek its head over the horizon, as the sky started to glow its hazy pink and orange hues, your bright red feathers graced my existence. As you landed on the concrete, I could feel my heart starting to race. You were truly a stimulant to my colorless life, that scarlet beacon of hope in the umbra that had overcome me. Watching your small beak grab those berries, tear open the outer skin, and rip into the flesh as delight spread over you, how could I possibly explain it? It was truly pure bliss. I was feeling honest happiness for the first time since I had been wrongfully pushed through the doors of this facility. They claimed me mad. Yet, does a madman find happiness in nature? Would a madman find it in his soul to assist a creature smaller than he in finding sustenance? If yes, then truly I may have been mad. But madmen seldom find a smile on their face as they absorb the beauty of our natural world. It was at this point that I chose to remove the chains that society had placed upon me. I stopped listening during the group meetings, and I chose to use you as my therapy. You would be what would guide me from here on. 
I made it a point to greet you with your morning berries for several days after this. I slept very little during these first few days, simply because I wanted to make sure that you would come back, and I wanted to make sure that you were the one to get them. I imagined that you had a nest somewhere nearby. You possibly had a newly hatched offspring that you were taking bits of this meal to, and you were making sure that your female counterpart was happily fed. This, this was nearly confirmed for me one morning, somewhere around two weeks since our little ritual had started. You arrived, right on time, but you were not alone. You swooped in and landed, making your delightful chirping sounds. Then, within a moment, another took flight from a nearby tree and landed right next to you. Her feathers lacked most of the color of yours, but they were all cherry-tipped, a beautiful gray that faded into a delightful red. That morning was a sign from the universe that I needed you to be happy, you and your new companion. You were all I needed during this time in my life, not this institute, not their heartless words of encouragement, and sure as hell not their godforsaken medication. It was then that this place and their methods ceased to exist for me. I found ways around their schedule of forcing me to take their pills. I started writing a short story about a bird. I explained to my orderly friend that I had found therapy in words. She was surprisingly encouraging, so much so that she and her manager came to my room to read what I had written and had decided that I should spend more time working on my newfound art than in group sessions. I agreed. Before they left my room that day, I made a single, potentially strange request to them. I told them that, over these past few days, I had been craving a simple pleasure for my time before being here. Sunflower seeds. I asked them if there was any way I could get unsalted sunflower seeds regularly, as I used to thoroughly enjoy them. I remember the head orderly gave me a slight look of concern, and then glanced back down at my writing project. I believe that he may have had a strange feeling of success in his mind. Maybe he thought that I was getting better and that they were the ones that were causing it. He made me a deal. So long as I kept writing and could show that I was making progress, he would bring me a full bag of sunflower seeds per week. He made it very clear that if I faltered, this deal would be off. I promised him that I had no intentions to quit my writing. And with that, I could now give you something to enjoy and I would no longer have to risk getting caught with the berries in my pocket. Over the next week, I felt lighter. I felt like my head was clearing out an overcast that had been there for as long as I could remember. You were the cause of my happiness. You were the reason my heart was able to feel again, and you were what I needed in my life. I had stopped sleeping entirely during this week, the medication was fully out of my system. I had practically stopped eating and was no longer speaking to anyone. I now had assurance that you, and now your mate, would always come back to my window and I could not have been happier. That is, until this morning. Something about this morning felt strange. I hadn't fallen asleep, I knew that for a fact, but for some reason I felt like my mind had fallen into a type of self-preservation. I watched the clock near my bed, but there was a point where I'm fairly certain that it stopped counting the time. For some reason I could no longer read the numbers that it displayed. I would not be deterred by this malfunctioning device. I turned back toward the window and waited for the sun to continue rising, except... It didn't. On this morning, the sky seemed desperately overcast, and a light fog lifted off of the dew-covered leaves. No matter, I knew that even if the sun was slow to rise, you would still show up, and you would show up right on time. I pulled open my window, 
pushed the screen from the corner and displayed a pile of seeds that I had been given, a buffet of sorts for you and your friend that I knew you could not resist. I sat, and I waited for you to fly down through the haze and land so valiantly as you greeted me. I waited solely for you to once again grace me with your beauty. But what showed up on my windowsill that morning was not you. The creature that landed looked like you solely in the fact that it contained red feathers upon its wings, and it held your same black eyes. From the haze fell this abomination that stood at least five times your size, with wings that surely fell into the double digits and seemed to be placed at random. It held your black eyes, sure, but more than your two. It seemed to be able to see in every direction at once, its talons bent in ways that would have been painful to any other creature. Its tail contained multiple layers of feathers, and its beak, oh god, its beak, no longer did it have the small orange mouth that you would so delicately pick at your food with. No, this creature's mouth was nothing more than a hole filled with sharp fragments of what I could only assume were teeth. This disgusting creature that now filled my vision landed and stared at me, making patterns of shrill metallic clicks that caused my brain to feel agony. Every single piece of its song as it whistled was enough to drive me to madness and cause my blood to run ice cold. My spine felt weak, my hands were clammy, and my face was covered in a fear-induced sweat. All of this was compounded when a second of this hideous monster landed beside the original, her feathers the same cherry-tipped gray as my songbird's female companion. She made the same shrill screeches as the first. I felt like I wanted to vomit. These two things, I have no idea what to truly call them, both stood and stared at me with hunger in their eyes. What feels worse, I know now that these two beasts are here to stay. It's been what I can only imagine to be a few hours, and they haven't left. I can see by the look in their eyes that they are hungry, and are willing to do anything they can to get their next meal, as the tooth-lined void of their face fills with drool. And what's worse, they seem to show no interest in the sunflower seeds that I so delicately placed upon the windowsill. I've been trying to get this message out to someone, anyone, for weeks. I'm hoping, as I have every other time I have tried this, that this is the one that makes it out there. Although I'm starting to think that it might never happen, I don't know how to explain what's going on, because to be honest, I have no clue how I wound up here, or where here really is. I think I might be stuck in some sort of Groundhog Day situation, but I'll get to that in a bit. First, I think I need to tell you where I am. It's an old hotel in the middle of nowhere, located at the end of a dirt road. I've tried walking down the road, thinking that at some point I'd hit a busy street. But that doesn't happen. I tried this for a week. A full week that consisted of me walking down the same dirt road for hours. I left the hotel in a few minutes after sunrise. And by the night, the sun set. I was still walking down the same road. I stopped doing that after I finally accepted the fact that it wasn't going to work. I think that I need someone to come find me. There's nothing but trees, which extends as far as I can see. There's a mountain a few miles behind the hotel. But there are never any wild animals, despite the fact that it is very clearly located in the middle of a forest. The hotel is an old, rundown building with exposed brick on the outside and a broken neon sign that simply reads, Hotel. Except, only the O glows anymore. That's how I know how long I've been here. When I first got here, all five letters lit up at nighttime, and with each passing week a random letter stops glowing. 
I don't know what's going to happen to me when they all turn off. I really don't think I want to find out. I think this might be the last shot of getting out of this place. There's a small parking lot in the front of the hotel, with eight parking spaces but no vehicles. The parking lot itself is littered with dead leaves and random trash with riddled potholes. The door to the lobby creaks every time it's touched, and whenever I open or close it, I feel like it's going to disintegrate. Everything in here is so old. The furniture is made of faded, splintering wood, and all the bed sheets are faded and see-through from all the wear. The pillows are flat, and pretty much every single thing in this place creaks. Even the carpet is dirty and rough. There are only two rooms, but one of them is always locked. Every morning, I wake up in the second room. In there, there's a bed with two pillows and a light blue bed sheets, a bedside table with a white lamp, a small bench by the door, a closet, a telephone that doesn't work, and a small bathroom with a toilet, a sink, and a shower. Any water that comes out of the faucet is lukewarm, and there's only one bar of soap in the bathroom that somehow never shrinks, no matter how much I use it. Which, you know, I suppose that's a pretty good thing. The day always goes as follows, without fail. I wake up and walk around the hotel, hoping to run into someone, anyone else, but I don't. The only other person in the hotel is the concierge, a woman in an old white pants suit who never speaks to me and acts as if I'm not even here. Every once in a while, I try to catch her attention, but nothing has worked yet. I usually find something to eat at each mealtime, which appears on a random cart in my room. I've never seen anyone bring it in, and there's no kitchen here, so I don't know how. I don't know where it comes from. At first, I was skeptical about eating the food, but so far it's been fine. It's edible and not poisonous which is good enough for me. Recently, I've spent my days trying to send out messages similar to this one. I found an old laptop in one of the drawers in my room. Somehow, it never runs out of battery, but there's not much I can do with it, as there's no internet connection here. Maybe it's foolish of me to try this over and over, knowing that the chance of this actually working are pretty much non-existent. But... I think I'd go crazy if I didn't at least hope for a miracle of sorts. At around 5 p.m., someone arrives at the hotel. It's always a different person, a different gender, different background, different ethnicity. I always see them right after they arrive, and they are looking for their room. They can never tell me where they are coming from, where they are going, or how they ended up here. They all say the same thing. I'm just passing through and I always end up sleeping with them. I never remember who initiated it, or why, or how. I just see the person, we introduce ourselves, and the next thing I know, we're having sex in the hotel room, on the old bed sheets. The next morning, I wake up and they're gone. They always die. And even though I know this, I still roam around the hotel looking for them. The first time this happened, it was a man whose name was Tristan. The next morning, I found his head in the lobby on the front desk. Concierge ignored it. They all die differently. Sometimes it looks like they fell. Sometimes their deaths look impossible. Like gunshot wounds, even though there are no guns here. Or stabbings, but no whooping around. It makes me sad to say that I'm no longer phased by their deaths. It's part of the routine now. I wake up and I immediately start looking for their bodies. I just, I can't just not have sex with them. It always happens. It's like it's part of a cycle that I can't break, no matter how hard I try. Someone always arrives. I always end up running into them. We always have sex, and then they always die. If I walk a few miles into the woods, I can find the pile of bodies that belong to all of the previous guest. Sometimes I wonder if I'll eventually end up here too. The concierge lady is the one who drags the bodies out there. 
I've seen her do it, and so I know she's aware of the situation. This makes the fact that she always completely ignores me much more irritating. She clearly knows something, and I don't know why she doesn't acknowledge me. Maybe that's the part of her cycle. Maybe she can't talk to me in the same way that I can't leave this place or break out of this weird routine. I noticed when the sun started setting that the O in the sign outside was starting to flash on and off. Something tells me that I don't have much time left. I have many a day before the O turns off completely, and well, I don't know really. But I have this feeling in the pit of my stomach, the kind that you get when you just know something is off and something bad is going to happen. I left my room earlier around 5 p.m. to see who the next guest was going to be. I stood in the lobby, staring at the door while the lady stood behind the counter, clicking away on her keyboard and staring at the black computer screen. But no one came. I waited until 5.15, but the door never opened, and no one ever came into the hotel. I'm really starting to freak out now. Not that I wasn't before, but the only thing scarier than being stuck in some weird routine is when that routine stops abruptly. At least before I knew what to expect. But now what? I headed back up to my room. After no one showed up, as I walked down the hall, I noticed it. A third door? It was the same as the other two doors. Same peeling, light brown paint, same rusty doorknob, except it wasn't there before. There were only two rooms in this hotel, and now there were three. I lifted my hand and knocked my knuckles against the door three times. No answer. I pressed my ear against the door, but there was only silence. I made my way back to the lobby, where the lady was still clicking away at nothing. I walked out of the hotel's door. I headed straight to the woods, towards the pile of dead bodies. I don't know what I expected to find, but there was nothing here. Nothing. The bodies were gone. They had vanished somehow. I wandered around the area a bit, squinting in the dim light of the fading sun, but I found nothing. I made my way back to the hotel and stopped in the middle of the parking lot. It was a lot darker than usual, and I looked up to see that the O was no longer lit up. I'm back in my room now, attempting this for what I think might be the last time. I hope this works. I need someone to see this. Maybe someone somewhere will know what's going on and how I can get out of this, whatever it is. I really hope this works. I don't think I'll make it until morning. I am Magpie Stories, and I present The Forgotten. Many people imagine castles to be a fantastic structure, one of myths and legends, ramparts and stone and mystery. They house the dungeons for elderly enemies of the realm, the Victorian pageantry, and the dignity of these stories is what people remember, of the gothic tales and the winding passages. The truth is more brutal and transcends the romantic stories you have been told. And there was no escaping the fact that the voice that spoke these words was intoned in such a way that made his audience hold their breath in anticipation. But Chris was faking it. Is that the dungeon? A child, thick glasses, and a touch towards the path of obesity chimed in. Chris sighed internally and stitched a grin onto his face and thought great. One of them. Yes, young man, though we call it. The Ooblot. He shouted excitedly, pleased at his own precociousness. No, it's called an oubliette, he corrected, taking the small pleasure he could from seeing the frown on the boy's face. As I was saying, he continued the tour, outlining the grislier facts about the place. This was the one time he would allow himself to enjoy his job, scaring the small kids especially the annoying ones, especially 
the American ones who constantly assumed he knew so-and-so, and everyone lived in a version of a Mary Poppins film. This was not the path he had seen for himself. He had been in a pilot for a TV series on the BBC. Chris thought he would have made it. The pilot never went any further than that, and he had gotten himself a reputation as an arsehole. Difficult, and a prima donna. He would get drunk, miss potential jobs, get in the papers for all the wrong reasons. He had even thought about being one of those influencers, but it never caught on. Now, here he was in this museum, in this castle, pretending he gave a shit. And this was only a job to keep him in funds. Something for just a little while. The last guy had quit and just disappeared, to be honest. Chris speculated he might just do the same at any moment. Walk out. He would even take the stupid costume. It would be a good thing to keep for fancy dress parties or just for a laugh when out on the piss. The gall and bitterness swelled inside him. But that's so cool, it's a real dungeon. The child was wide-eyed now, parents placing a hand on his shoulder, beaming with pride that they would be able to show people that they had been to a real castle that was not made out of plastic. This was one they had visited in an old country. The stonework was crumbling, but they would be able to tell the folks back home, oh, and their boy was being so smart. Chris grinned. He knew what to do. I'm sure you know voice thick with conspiratorial tones, what oubliette means. The boy was slowly shaking his head. The scene was like that of the hypnotic eyes of a predator about to devour a helpless, young and warm-blooded thing. It means forgotten. He beckoned a finger to the young man. Come on, I've something to show you. Come here, please. The young boy's eyes glinted wetly. You could see the slight stiffening of his frame, his parents pushing him closer to the man in the colourful outfit. Look through the bars here. The boy did. A man would be thrown down in there, in a dark, with room enough to stand, but not to sit or lie down. As the boy looked, his mind played tricks. He thought he could see shadows moving quickly. Chris continued. You would be left alone in the dark. They would not even talk to you as they lowered you in. The sound of the metal on the edge of the lip of rock, the last sound the poor sod would hear from another human being. The darkness would play tricks on their minds. Chris's conspiratorial words now went lower, whispering them like poison into the small boy's ear, out of sheer spite. The boy's breathing was shallow, ribs barely moving, mouth hung open. His urge to leave now left behind with a paralysing terror, one that crept from the soles of his feet and into his body. He had to listen. It reminded him of when he was at the dentist and had that tooth removed. It had cracked and split, like the sound of matchsticks but so much louder in his head. The boy knew part of him was being destroyed and could do nothing about it. He felt that way now. They went mad before they died, in the dark, alone. One guard heard so much shrieking from a nobleman, lasted for hours and hours and it sounded like a trapped animal then gargling. He had ripped his own vocal cords to shreds. And now, the P.S. The Resistance. Look, in the dark, they say not all of them were taken out. The boy continued staring white-eyed. Chris knew it would not be long now. It never was. Almost within a second, someone peered into the grill and snapped a picture. It was all he needed. The boy screamed body returning to his control and dashed out of the subterranean vault, the feeling of claustrophobia not leaving him as he emerged, birthed into the grey English skies and rain. The boy's father felt disappointed at his son. His mother, concerned for her boy, scampered after him. Chris felt the thin needles of pleasure burrow into him. Served the little shit right. But mommy, it was... The conversation echoing from the outside, muffled and deadened by the thick stone and the damp. The father peered into the stone well and saw what his son had been so scared of. Cheap Halloween decorations, resin bone and a plastic skull. He grunted cheaply and listened to the rest of the tour. He was not going to have his trip spoiled. Chris's shift drew to a close. The last of the visitors trundled out of the gate, bags filled with pencils and fridge magnets and traditional packs of fudge. Really, it was the same old stuff you could get anywhere, just in a different box and at four times the price. He did not care. He knew it would be the same old shit tomorrow. Time enough for a few solitary drinks, and the usual being 
bitter at the world. See you tomorrow, Chris, Fran said as he went to leave. He ignored her as usual, light brown jacket not really covering the boldness and colour of his work uniform. Most changed out of their costumes, but he did not care. He began to head for home. Fran felt sorry for Chris. She had a son, a little older, who was also a bit wayward. She turned into the gift shop to lock up. She was the last one left on sight now. Oh, Chris turned on his heel as he remembered he had left his flagon in the fucking oubliette. He sighed. This was the only way he could get booze into work. He found a mix of vodka and fresh mint worked well at disguising the smell. He ummed and ahed a little, and then realised he did not want to spend the day sober as a judge. He meandered back in, hating the fact the lighting system was on a timer. At least he had a phone. The thin light was eaten quickly by the cave as he stepped down. A golden halo glinted by the metal grill. At least he had found it quickly. He stooped, banging his head and gulping in a sharp intake of breath as his head, well, did not swim so much as gently paddle. As he stood regaining his senses, he heard a noise. The sound of metal on stone. No, it must be the banging of his head. Still, he cocked to one side, trying to listen, squinting further into the darkness. Powerful skeletal fingers grabbed deeply into his ankles, the fingers transmitting their message clearly. Deep hunger and ferocity in the blackness, Chris whimpered, unable to function rationally enough to scream, his fight-or-flight response completely failing him. As he inexorably was pulled in, he screamed for a while, the quality of his voice changing in line with wet, unorganic sounds of violence. The last noises he would ever make were lost, burying themselves into the cold, stone walls. The oubliette served its primary function. He lived alone, had few friends, and Chris had distanced himself over the course of years and the course of poor decisions from his entire family. He was forgotten. The only thing missed was his nylon harlequin suit. His employers presumed he had just taken it. After a week, they chalked it up as lost and forgot about him. He had not answered calls. Ew, that looks gross. A comment from an American tourist talking about the remains in the dark. A small boy peered into the hole. It was funny the guide thought. He was sure he had not noticed it before. Whoever had brought them in had done an amazing job of making them look real, how the skin had sloughed off the body so organically. He was not sure how they had gotten it so deep into the oubliette. Mind you, he appreciated the fine details like the gouges and the wet algae that slicked the sides of the walls. It didn't matter. He wouldn't be here long. This was only a summer job. Thank you for watching today. I hope you're all having a wonderful Valentine's Day. Please subscribe and go check out the channels of my fellow collaborators. This was such a fun murder to get together. Bye-bye, <laughs> my darlings. Thank you so kindly for stopping by my chateau, my darlings. It does mean so much to me. Please, if you have not subscribed, as many of you have not, please do so. Give me a like so I know what you would like to hear. And comment. I always love to read your comments. And special thanks to my Patreon and membership supporters. Ciao, darlings.
Thank you for watching today. I hope you're all having a wonderful Valentine's Day. Please subscribe and go check out the channels of my fellow collaborators. This was such a fun murder to get together. Bye-bye, <laughs> my darlings.